Can I get everyone's attention? Good evening. I've met some of you and was talking with some of you and some people drove from Boston in the rush hour traffic to get here for seven. This is a really important presentation tonight and it's gonna help you understand deaf education and the challenges related with mainstream education. So first I'll introduce who I am. My name is Tim Riker and I teach here at Brown University. It's a wonderful program and many of my students are here, which I'm happy to see you here. So before we go on, I wanted to introduce Steve Florio. He is the executive director of the Rhode Island Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. And so I'd like to ask him to come up. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everybody. I'm thrilled to see you all here. I'm really excited. I've been looking forward to this presentation tonight and really happy that he was able to come. This event is part of Deaf Awareness Month. It's not Deaf Awareness Week anymore. We have a lot of different events that were planned through September, and I hope that you've enjoyed going to some of them. So I'd like to introduce our speaker. His name is Mark Drollsball. And he was born into a deaf family, his second generation, and he was born hearing. And as he was growing up, he had some progressive hearing loss. So I went to the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf in Philadelphia and knew him, and I knew his mom because she worked there. And then when I went to college at Gallaudet, I looked at him and he was deaf. So as we were growing up, he was more hearing, and then I saw him at college and he was deaf, and he'll talk more about that. So I'm so happy that he's here, and you know we know the same people from our childhood, and it's just great to see him. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's in school counseling from Gallaudet University, and he currently works as a school counselor at the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf, and has been there for 20 years. He's written many papers and articles for the National Deaf News, um, for the Silent News, different deaf newspapers and publications. He's also authored four books. The first book was called Deaf Again, and that's in its fourth edition now. The second book was Anything But Silent, and that really touched on, oh, had different articles that he had written and they were put into one book. The third book was called On the Fence. The so it's the silent world of the hard of hearing. And he collected different people's experiences and frustrations of hard of hearing people and put them into a book. And they were similar with his experience. And now the fourth book is called Madness in the Mainstream, which is what he's talking about tonight, and really looking forward to his presentation. If you could help me welcome Mark. So first, I'd also like to recognize Rhode Island Hamilton Relay for sponsoring this event and helping Mark be able to come and making this possible. Thank you, Hamilton. Thank you, Steve. All right, before we begin talking about madness in the mainstream, we need to review some laws. Public law 94-142. This law passed in 1975. And it was a good thing. It guaranteed equal education for all. It was a good thing, but it had one problem, and that was L-R-E. Does anyone know what L-R-E means? Least restrictive environment, you're right. 
L-R-E means least restrictive environment. <laughs> I have a different definition for it. And I can explain. This is a summary of LRE. But the point of the law 94-142 that was later changed and called the IDEA, with Individuals with Def Disabilities Education Act, but the point was to make sure that no one was excluded. And it was important because before that law was enacted, an education was a, a bad situation for individuals with disabilities. If you had a disability, whether you were deaf or you had a learning disability, you were autistic, you were put in the back of the room and you watched movies all day. And do you think that those students really learned anything? They didn't, and so we needed that law to pass to really guarantee an education for all. So the problem with LRE, I was just saying that it's not right to exclude students and they need to have access. The problem with the deaf and hard of hearing is that it's different. Deaf and hard of hearing like to be in a group where they relate with others and feel that they're the same as other people. And so say I'm deaf and I'm put in the class of 100 hearing students. I'm going to stumble and not feel comfortable if I was put in a class with 100 deaf or hearing signers, I would be so comfortable. But the LRE doesn't recognize that. LRE says the other environment's better, mainstream, that's the best. And so we need to back up, we need to look and be careful. And I can show you how those mistakes can happen. So I'm gonna start with talking about my first IEP that I was involved with at my job, 1994, and my new job as a school counselor. I was so eager, and I had to write an IEP. And so my supervisor um, came and asked me, they wanted me to help write the IEP summary. They told me what student it was, and that student was 10 years old. He was a, a typical deaf student, and his parents were deaf and his sister was deaf, and so he had a whole deaf family. And so that student grow, grew up exposed to language and developed language appropriately. And so that student could read, write, do math and science, and excel to academics. It was a wonderful student. And so I looked at him and I thought, this is gonna be easy to write this IEP. And so I went ahead and typed up all these positive, attributes of the student, and they have a good attitude, and they excel at academics, and I printed it out and gave it to my supervisor. Oh, let me back up for a minute. I was really proud. I just have to put that out there. It was my first IEP of my new job. And so I s kept a copy of it for myself to look back. You know how if a store opens, they'll keep the first dollar that they make and put it up on the wall? Well, this was my first IEP, and so I'm gonna show it to you now. It was beautiful, it was perfection. I was so happy. I felt like I was the greatest school counselor in the world. So 20 minutes later, I'm in my office working on the computer and I hear a loud knocking on the door, I could feel it, and my supervisor comes back. And I said, what's going on? And he said, you know that IEP that you just gave me? And I said, yeah, it was great. He said, no, you can't use it. And I was really confused why it was perfect. And he said, well, that was the problem, it was perfect. If this student has all these great attributes and all these skills, the school district is gonna look at that and say, all right, well, he doesn't need to, to be here. He can go and be mainstreamed. And I was really confused, I didn't understand that. So he said, you need to show the needs of the student. 
this student is deaf, he can't hear, he can't use a hearing aid, he, he needs speech support. And so I realized that I had to revise the whole thing. So I accepted that and I got to work, made all these modifications and I had to put this student can't hear and can't speak. He needs speech support, he gets frustrated. Sometimes he needs counseling support and has emotional issues. And I had to say all these negative things to make to show that he had all these needs. And I sent it to my supervisor and he said, that's much better. And you know, it was still my first IEP. I still made a copy of it. And I kept the second one. I'll show you a picture of that one. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. But it was an interesting experience, and that was my first time understanding and thinking about the difference between mainstream education and deaf schools. And so I admit I was naive at the time. My perspective and the school district's perspective were very different. My perspective is that a deaf school and a hearing school, no, excuse me, a hearing school is a place where hearing kids go to listen and learn auditorily. And a deaf school is a place where deaf children go to learn receptively using their vision. And so they're the same though, just they use a different language, that's all. But the school department, their perspective was very different. They say, they look at the ideal, you know, the, the public school is the number one, the hearing school. And if a student fails there, then we'll put them down at the deaf school as the second choice. And that really hit me hard, because I always thought of them as an equal thing, and the school department doesn't interpret it that way. And I, you know, I'm realizing now that deaf students tend to go into mainstream education. And recently I've been thinking about why is this happening? So I decided to do some research on the topic and I studied a boy, Darren. And it was easy to study, because he's my son. <laughs> so what happened with my son, he was born the same as I, he was born with normal hearing, and then around age six or seven, he started to lose his hearing. And so we went to the audiologist and found out, you know, that he was deaf. And so right away, we called for an IEP. My wife and I agreed that we would go to talk about an IEP. And we were a little nervous because, you know, IEP meetings are tough. So here's a picture of one. <laughs> there's a lot of people at these meetings. You go in and there's a big conference room table with all the different staff people there and it's very overwhelming. And out on the street, there's a man selling tickets to the IEP because that's how, that's how popular they are. And so you feel really overwhelmed. So I sat down and my wife sat down and we looked at each other and we said, good luck. And so right away, one of the people that was the representative from the school district, who was pretty high up as far as authority, made this suggestion right away. Let us know. You need to take your son to the hospital to be evaluated for a cochlear implant. That needs to happen right away. And I was so thrown off by that. And I'm not saying I'm anti-cochlear implant. I'm just saying that instead of offering me options, that was the one thing that they said. It's like a menu. I, don't, I want a hamburger, french fries, maybe a salad, maybe a soda, 
but they just offered that one choice. Maybe they could have recommended an FM system, cart services, an interpreter, putting him in a deaf program. That would have been fine, but no, they just offered that one choice, that one suggestion. So my wife and I talked, and we said, we disagree. We would like to have an interpreter. And they said, no, we really think the CI. And we said, no, we really think the interpreter. And it, people at the table, it looked like it was they were watching a tennis match going back and forth. And finally, they agreed, OK, we'll go ahead with the CI first. And if that fails, then we'll provide an interpreter. And we said, no, an interpreter, that's it. And finally, they agreed. But that experience really hit, hit me hard. And I thought to myself, what if I weren't deaf? What if I were a hearing parent that didn't know anything about deaf culture or the different opportunities and choices that were out there? I'd be like, OK, we're on the way to the hospital right now. Because they didn't give me enough information. So we left that meeting. And I really thought to myself, what just happened here? And so what happened was, is they were just focusing on the disability, on fixing the ears, the, the hearing. There was no dis discussion about communication strategies or learning strategies. And it had a really big impact on me. So we got the interpreter. And everything was going really well at school. He had a great teacher. They had made sure that movies were captioned. But I noticed some changes in him. You know, an interpreter has really covered that gap academically, but not socially. So we noticed that he started socializing less and less. He did great out in the play yard, but in the cafeteria, he became very withdrawn. And I asked him, you know, maybe you'd like to go to a deaf school. And he said, no. He said, well, I want to grow up with my hearing friends. I don't want to not be ready for the real world when I get out there. So we gave him a little time to ponder that. But I also noticed, you know, he kept saying he was fine. Yet he had nothing to compare this to. He had absolutely no frame of reference. Had he had that comparison, it might have made a big difference. I had that frame of reference, so I filed that away for a future conversation. <laughs> Mainstreaming can be very stressful. And issues may come up later. And I'll expand on that in a few minutes, of course. But it's serious. With no frame of reference, this is what happens. You start to drown, but you don't know you're drowning until you're underwater. You don't know any better. And it would be too late by then to jump ship. The issue still was interesting to me. I felt a little dissatisfied. I knew how tough mainstreaming could be, so I did some research and discovered Dr. Mindy Hopper, who did her PhD dissertation on a fascinating topic. What she did was compare a deaf student who was in the mainstream with a hearing student at the exact same school. She gave them each a task. Every morning on the bus, when they're riding on the school bus, they'd have to go direct, get off the bus, go directly to school, and enter into a laptop everything they saw and heard on the bus. And they'd have to do the same thing at lunch after lunch from the cafeteria, enter everything that they saw and heard. So here's what happened. The boys, uh, the first, the hearing student, excuse me, the deaf student noticed there's a kid on the bus with new shoes. The driver looks a little bit cranky. 
there's a couple over there, but now they're not sitting together. They used to sit together, but now they're not sitting together. I wonder if they were boyfriend and girlfriend. Another student is coughing. He must be sick. The hearing student had so much more data, so much richer. The reason those couple, that couple's not sitting together is because they had a fight. And I heard this other student has a stomach virus, so everybody be careful because there might be something wrong with the food and everyone should be washing their hands. And I also heard, and it went on from there, very rich information. And during that research, Dr. Hopper then exchanged the transcripts for the hearing child to read the deaf student's um, information and vice versa. And the deaf student realized that in one morning, all the information they had missed was absolutely staggering. And that was powerful research. So I went ahead with my own and I decided to compare students in the mainstream with students at residential or regular schools for the deaf. And I noticed that deaf students in the mainstream with interpreters were very dependent on the interpreter. So the teacher would speak, and then the interpreter would interpret, and then the student would receive that information. So it was kind of, a, a, there was a delay, and it was third hand. The hearing students would raise their hand and say something. The interpreter would catch that. But when the deaf student wanted to raise their hand and add on to it, there was too much of a delay. Because not interpreters can't do it in real time. They need a little bit of processing time. So the deaf student was always a little bit out when it came to spontaneous conversation. As far as joining sports, no problem. When the game was over, the hearing kids would congratulate each other and say, good job, and they'd all fist bump. And the deaf student was always left alone. They weren't invited out afterwards. Or when they did join, they were kind of a lump on a log. They didn't feel comfortable. They had nothing to say or couldn't say anything. Compared to the school for the deaf, at the school for the deaf, Classroom communication is direct. The student uses American Sign Language. The students get the information immediately. There's no interpretation. The student raises their hand and makes a comment. Other people see that comment and can agree or disagree, and a dialogue ensues. It's very smooth and in real time. When class is over, the learning continues. Walking down the hall, students can converse with one another. They learn things. They go to the cafeteria. They talk some more. They go to the dorm, and they continue the conversation. So it's a total immersion. It's complete access. It makes a world of difference. When it comes to sports, the kids would play, and then they'd all go out to eat afterwards and keep on talking. So it was nonstop learning, nonstop communication, whereas in the hearing school, it was from 8 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and then that was the end of the conversation. With the deaf school, the conversation was 24-7. Now, back to LRE. Which is least restrictive? To me, it's obvious that the school for the deaf is the least restrictive environment. In the hearing school, the deaf person has to be more passive. So that's kind of a confusing thing to process. Also, I lied a little bit. I said that I was comparing one school with another school, but that, those, that, that's my son. <laughs> I'm talking about my son in the mainstream versus my son at MSSD, Model Secondary School for the Deaf, and he is so much happier there. So far, I've been telling you about my experience, my job, mainstreaming, my son. But that's not all there is. There are lots of people out there who are going through the exact same thing. The book Alone in the Mainstream was written by a woman, Gina Olivia. She's incredible. And that book had a huge impact on me. And that's what motivated me to write Madness in the Mainstream. And then there's Turning the Tide, again, written by Gina Olivia, with a co-author, Linda Risser Little. 
and it's very comprehensive. There is so much research in there. So if you have an IEP and you get into a disagreement, this is the book to present. Case closed. All the documentation and proof is in that book. <coughs> now I'm going to get a little bit more into the mainstream, and I should warn you, um, deaf students in the mainstream, when you look at them, they really do seem fine. They look like they're doing well. But I just want to caution you, mainstream students have survival skills. When I was in the mainstream, I looked successful. K through 12, I was a big success. Uh, but now I call myself a mainstream survivor. And the reason I say that is that I had to fool people every day. Obviously, you know, the head is always bobbing. It looks like a positive thing. That's a survival skill, the yes head. So many kids in the mainstream are always nodding. It's that deaf nod. What did he say? Oh, I don't know. What did he say? I don't know. Just keep on smiling and it'll, it'll go away. And that is one survival skill. Here's some others. This is one of my favorites in the gym. The hearing teacher would give instructions verbally. And by the way, I didn't have an interpreter from K through nine. Later I did get one in high school, but the earlier grades I did not have an interpreter, so I pretended I understood. In gym class, the teacher would say, okay kids, everybody line up and here's what we're gonna do today. And these are the rules. And then the rules would be given verbally, and of course I couldn't hear them, so I pretended to hear them, but they, I didn't hear a word. And then, enough, let's get out there. Everyone line up, now we're gonna play. And the hearing kids would all run out the door, and I would walk very slowly, because I wanted to be last. I could watch what all the other kids were doing, so that by the time it was my turn, I had a pretty good idea of what was expected of me. And that's how I got by. And I typically did things right. And the gym teacher said, boy, for a deaf kid, he's really brave. He's doing really well. And of course, I would you know, be so glad that I fooled the teacher once again. But that happened all the time. In the classroom, it was pretty much the same. There was no interpreter. So I sat there pretending like I knew everything was going on and took notes and you know, the other students could hear and take notes, and if I saw them reacting a certain way with a certain facial expression, I would just copy it. And then later I'd say, what's so funny? And they'd say, I don't know. So I just faked it all the way through. And when class was over, after about an hour, and that was a long time to sit there not understanding anything, there was homework. And it wasn't written on the board sometimes, so I always had a friend, and I'd say, what's the homework? And I called that person my informant. That person would help me out, give me some of the things that I missed, and I was so grateful for that. Then I'd get home, and I'd study to catch up on all the things I hadn't heard all day long. I'd read the book, read the handouts, and if I got stuck in the textbook, because you know sometimes the information is missing from those books, or the teacher might say something that uh, enhances or goes off the point of the textbook, I would realize I didn't have that information. I would have to live with it. And I'd put on my coat and go outside, even in the snow and the sleet, I would walk up the hill to the library. And then I'd get to the library, and where's that catalog? And I'd open up the drawer, these were the good old days, and I'd find the book I needed, and I'd open it up and find out the information that I had missed. Put the book back, put the card back, put my jacket back on, walk back home in the snow and the sleet, five miles to my house, get home and put the information in my paper. But I should give you a little time out here. This was in the 80s. You guys are so lucky now. Now all you have to do is look at Wikipedia and it's all there. You're so lucky. Back in my day, it was a lot more work. It really sucked, but you know, we did what we had to do. I did what I could to fill in the missing information, hand in my papers and reports. The teacher would uh, be very impressed and say, wow, for a deaf kid, 
he does really well. He's just like a hearing kid. And of course, I collaborated with that, or corroborated that, and I realized I had fooled my teachers once again. So I did a lot of work to get by. There's another technique. I don't know. So you're sitting there pretending you understand, and the teacher's talking away, and then they ask you a question. What can you possibly do? You could ask the teacher to repeat it once, but a second repetition, if I understood it, great, but if I didn't understand it, I was in big trouble. So typically after the second time of the teacher asking the question and me not getting it, uh, they're not gonna repeat it again because there's a big classroom to handle. And I didn't want everyone staring at me watching this communication struggle happen, so I would just say, I don't know. I'd rather look stupid than look deaf. You know, there's a lot of stupid people out there, but there aren't very many deaf people out there. I f I'd rather fit in with the stupid people, at least at the time. One problem with that is one day we had a substitute teacher. Teacher was talking away and asked a question. I said, what did you say? And she said it again. And I said, I don't know. And everyone in the class started laughing their heads off. And I said, what? What did I say? Well, the teacher had said, what's your name? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> Busted. So that was a moment of reckoning. She reported it to the principal. And they called a meeting. And the result of that is what got me an interpreter. In some ways, I'm grateful, but in other ways, boy, what I went through to get there. Now, music class. You know, hearing kids love music. Not so much deaf people, but it's required, and I had to go to the class. So we'd be looking at this, pretending to sing. Of course, I wasn't using my voice. I don't want to break the windows. I don't want to have to pay for them either. So. I pretended to sing. I would watch the other kids, I'd look at their mouths, and I would try to do the same mouth gestures that they were doing, but, you know, honestly, nowadays a deaf person wouldn't be required to go to a music class, but back then we were. Here's another thing I used to do. Everyone in the room can hear, and they're all saying, hi, hey, what's up, how you doing? Chit-chatting, making small talk. Very superficial. Anything deep really wasn't likely to happen in those situations. But I do remember back in the 90s, we, I went to a workshop for hard of hearing children. And we were talking about things like, how do you survive in family gatherings? And if you're deaf or hard of hearing, what do you do? And one boy said, he was 13, and he said, uh, well, here's what I do. I say, hello, and then I bolt. And they said, what do you mean you bolt? And he said, well, once you say hello, how you doing, that's enough. If I stay for the deeper chat, they're going to start asking me questions, which I won't understand, and I'm going to feel embarrassed. So I'd rather say, how you doing, and then leave. And I said, wow, what do you other people do? It turns out they go into another room and play games. And then they come back for the superficial stuff, for the intro of another class, and then they go play games. And I thought... That's really sad, they're missing so much, but clearly that's a survival skill. Here's another one. Sometimes deaf and hard of hearing people who can speak, someone will say, hey, what's up, how you doing? And they'll say, fine, and then they'll just start st talking your head off. They'll dominate the entire conversation. And you can't get a word in edgewise. I feel so sorry for the hearing people because they can't get a word in edgewise and then the deaf or hard of hearing person says bye and leaves the room. The more I talk, the less chance that I'll misunderstand you. Isn't that brilliant? It's another survival skill. This is a lot of work. When in fact, what you could do is say, hi, I'm deaf. 
but instead we do what we can to survive. So I'm gonna talk about introjection. We learn, you know, from psychology classes that focus on the Gestalt theory. The point of interjection is that when you grow up, from your parents, friends, family, your natural environment, you learn about their behavior, their beliefs, their ideas, and you internalize those, and you seek to emulate them. When you go to a movie, if there's two, a couple there, a man and a woman, they're watching the movie together, let's say, and if the movie is really romantic or happy or inspiring, the woman, you know, they don't mind crying a little bit. They're not embarrassed because, you know, lots of women do that in movie theaters. What about men, though? Men do not do that. They feel inspired or moved or saddened, but then they look around and they pretend like there's something in their eye. And if someone says, oh, are you sad? They go, oh, no, 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 there's something in my eye. They don't want to be caught being emotional because the interjection there. And I guarantee you, men, they learn this. Even from the time they're little boys, they fall, they scrape their knee, and someone, maybe their dad or a friend, says, look, don't be a baby, be a man. And that term, be a man, gets internalized. And many years later, there they are at that romantic movie, suppressing their tears. So that concept applies to the mainstream with deaf and hard of hearing children. It's really the same idea. I'm gonna show you some of ex examples of this. So we would tell the students, sit up front, pay attention, read my lips. And so the deaf student in a mainstream setting thinks, well, that's my responsibility. And then there's an overemphasis on wearing your hearing aids. And I'm not against hearing aids. I don't want you to think that. I think they're fine. But that constant emphasis of you have to wear your hearing aid, and if you don't have them, or you forgot them that day, you get in big trouble. And so you internalize that, thinking, I have to have my hearing aid on at all times. I hate this term, hearing impaired. Can't hear. The negative, the focus on the negative. Many times, staff will take a new student around who's deaf and say, this is Sue, she's hearing impaired, she can't hear. So that student is seeing that can't, can't, can't language, and it internalizes it in a negative way, and that's deficit thinking, which is thinking of all the things you can't do. And that has a big impact. I have a story related to this next one. Typically, if a deaf and hard of hearing student says something using spoken language, you know, everyone will get very happy. So my high school, which was mainstream, every year, 10th grade would study Greek history, and you were required to participate. And so every class had to do a Greek play. And so my role in the show was to be in the Greek chorus, which is not a singing chorus. It's like the narrator. So you have some, some performance going on and then you have the narrator. And so there's four or five other students that were in a group and we were the narrators. So what I did is I would look at the script and I would take out some of the lines and get the cards, follow the index cards and I'd follow the other students and I'd memorize them. And so, of course, I would just say it with my voice off along with the other students that were saying it. But unfortunately, the day before the show, the teacher was watching us, the chorus, and caught the fact that I wasn't actually making any noise and saw that I was just mouthing the words. And so she said, Mark, come over here. I want to talk to you. So we sat down, and the teacher said, I noticed you didn't have your voice on when you were doing that. You have such loud, clear speech. Why don't you go ahead and use it? And I thought, okay. So the next day at the show, I used my voice and narrated with the rest of the group. I think that I cracked the window. Dogs out on the street were alert and howling at the noise. 
And my teacher said, she said to use my loud, clear voice. And so when the play was over, the teacher was crying and said, and gave me a big hug. And you said, you were loud and clear in your beautiful voice, and I could hear you just fine. And do you think that that, you know, made me feel empowered and happy? It didn't, because it really just was this emphasis on the things that I could do that were hearing-related were important and positive. Many times, deaf and hard of hearing children go for evaluations with different professionals, and we notice that you know the doctors have such authority. They have their white lab coat on, and they have their name on their pocket, and they discourage anybody from signing, and we think, oh, well, the doctor must know what he's talking about, and so we're not going to sign. And that has a huge impact on a deaf child. And so the introjection that I was talking about is that we internalize this message that you need to act hearing and it's your responsibility to assimilate. The problem is, is that that person then denies their deaf identity. And that's a lot of pressure. This quote really hit me. And it's really like if you grow up and you take, take in all these different theories and philosophies and you, you, have, you create this wall and you have a mask and your true self is covered. And so you really need to break that open and it's hard to do that and to say, I'm deaf and I'm proud of that. So in 1984, I was a senior in high school, and if someone had said, how are you doing, Mark? I would say, I'm fine, like any other hearing kid. And I would have believed it, because that was my mask, that was the wall I had up. In 1989, when I was at Gallaudet, I met other deaf people, and felt that unity, and that deaf identity, and that access to communication, I would have looked at that 1984 mark and said, you are an idiot, because I had that frame of re for reference. So this quote is related to parents, and we were talking about the doctors and what they say to do, but also with parents, parents really have the most impact on their child. And children grow up wanting their parents' approval. And if parents don't accept the fact that their child is deaf, then that child won't be able to accept it either, which is tough on the whole family. Okay, so we're gonna get rid of all the psychological lingo. We're gonna take a little break by having a pop quiz. Is everybody ready? You're all good students, I hope. So this is a true story. We have deaf student A and deaf student B, and they're both mainstreamed at the same school, and they're one year apart in grade, and this is an elementary school. So one day, deaf student B is under so much stress and the pressure and frustrations of mainstreaming that during an assembly, they have a breakdown and start crying and are very upset. So which student in that whole assembly, which one do you think is best equipped to really identify with that student and support that student? Some people are saying, deaf student A, of course, come on. It's obvious. Duh, of course. The answer to the question you think is obvious, but you're wrong. That's not what happens. 
this is a true story. And this happened and deaf student A and deaf student B were kept separated. And how do I know this story? Because my son was deaf student A. And his hearing brother noticed at the assembly this boy crying and let me know and said, Dad, there was this other student who was crying and was so upset. And I asked my other son, Darren. No, I said, was it Darren? He said, no, it was the other student. You know, and so my hearing son is used to seeing, you know, he's used to seeing his brother. And so it really took us, took us by surprise. So later on, I start, you know, I asked about it because I wanted to know what had happened, and the school obviously couldn't tell me because of confidentiality. But later on, one interpreter finally let me know. And was told that if they were interpreting for a student in a room, in a classroom, and there was another deaf student in the classroom, they weren't able to interpret for that student or interact with that student at all. And they were told that by the school district, and that's still going on. And so I, of course, you know, lost it. And it's a good school, don't get me wrong. The teachers are great. It's just that the policy and the directives, see, it just really, but the, the true irony of it is that they celebrate Diversity Day. You know, and there's, there's culturally deaf, hard of hearing, CIs, signing, speaking from a deaf family. Deaf people have diversity too, but that was kept separate. And I wrote about that in this book. And when it was printed, I gave it to the principal. And the principal from that school read that and agreed with me. And it wasn't his fault and he was obviously stuck because of the IEP. The other student, the other deaf student in that class did not have an interpreter and the parents didn't want them to have an interpreter. And so they were forced to keep those, the students separate. And that story really made my blood boil because keeping those two students apart, do you, do you think that was helpful? That was a myth really. And it was based on wrong information. And so now it's time for Mythbusters. And that's what we need to do. There's a lot of wrong information out there that we need to change. So the story I was talking about was this first myth that we need to keep them separate. Do you remember in the 1980s or 90s, I was noticing there was a deaf baseball player, Curtis Proud, Pride. Pride, who was a deaf baseball player. And he wasn't culturally deaf. He didn't sign. He grew up in an oral situation, but I didn't care. I was from a deaf family and I knew sign language, but I didn't care. I thought this guy's a baseball player, he's deaf. I'm gonna respect him, he's a great role model no matter what. And ironically, now he is the coach of the Gallaudet baseball team and can sign and I've met him, he's a very nice man. But at the time, when he didn't know sign language, I didn't care. And so interaction with other deaf kids, it doesn't matter if they're signing, if they have a CI, they use hearing aids, they believe in deaf power, it doesn't matter. That, that interaction shows deaf children that there's lots of different ways to be deaf and be successful, and it opens doors for them. If we say, no, you can't sign, it, it closes that door. Myth number two. People believe that signing makes, will hurt your English ability. 
But in actuality, the lack of language hurts your English. Many deaf children that grow up with no communication from birth to five, you know, they say zero to three is really the crucial time, but they grow up during that time with no language, then they have delays. They don't have access to communication. If they're born and they're in a language-rich environment, they'll pick up the, the English. But the problem is that many children don't have that communication and they're so frustrated and later they go to a deaf school, they pick up sign language, they make lots of improvements, but they can't get up to grade level. There's still that delay. And some people say, see, it's because they learn sign language. But really it starts from birth, that access to language has to be on day one. Do you notice hearing parents with hearing babies sign up for baby sign class in record numbers? And the why is research that proves that babies can sign before they can speak, no matter if they're deaf or hearing. And parents want to have that early communication. And so it's the same goes for deaf babies. The problem is some people say, oh, no, you don't sign, though, if the baby's deaf. And that's where it gets messed up. And obviously, reading is important because language is important. Signing, writing, all of it is important. So now we see more and more children that get cochlear implants, and then the doctors say you shouldn't sign because if you rely on sign language, you're, you're not going to rely on your hearing enough. And they're wrong. There's more and more research now showing children that have CIs and have language development, most of them have sign language behind it as the foundation. I did not have a cochlear implant, but I look back to when I was hearing and then I became hard of hearing. I remember how sign language helped me with that bridge between hearing and then seeing sign language. So this part, what's your problem? I remember when I was about six or seven and I was losing my hearing. I wasn't yet fully deaf, but I was starting to miss out on hearing things and communication. I had a friend named Donnie. He was the same age. We played a lot together. And what happened was that Donnie had three sisters and his oldest sister, she had some attitude, she was sassy. And so what would happen is we'd play and we'd be loud and she'd be like, what is your problem? Be quiet. And that was her typical response. The, pr the problem is, is I couldn't understand the word problem. So she'd say, what's your problem? And I would see, what's your, and then I wouldn't get the last word. And she'd say it again. I could get the P and the R, but I couldn't figure out what the word was. So I understood her concept that she was yelling at us, but I couldn't understand that word, and it was very frustrating. And so later, another time, I'm at the deaf club with my parents in Philadelphia, and a deaf woman was talking about some fight that she had with someone, and then she said, and I said, what's your problem? And the, the woman said, it's not my problem, it's your problem, and I'm watching her sign it and I interrupted and said, problem, can you spell that for me? And they said, P-R-O-B-L-E-M. And I finally understood the light, the light bulb went on. I learned this new word, thank you sign language. And so later back playing with Donnie and his sister again comes to yell at us and says, what's your problem? I got a huge smile on my face because I understood what she was talking about. And every time she would say, what's your problem? She didn't know why I was smiling at her. I was so happy because I understood what she was saying. And this is the last myth I'm going to share with you. Some parents really struggle with, should we stay in this mainstream education or go to a deaf school? And one of the reasons that they're nervous is because they, they don't want their child, they don't want to lose their child to deaf culture. 
And that's a myth, and I can prove it. I have two hearing children. My oldest... The oldest is deaf, 15. My second son is 12 and hearing. And my daughter is nine and hearing. So I have two hearing children. Every day we get up at 7.30. I say, go get your coat on, go to school, go to your hearing school. (laughs) And they go and then they come back. So I don't lose them to their hearing culture. Same with my deaf son, goes to the deaf school. He comes back. And I want to add that my son, when he was mainstream in eighth grade, he would arrive home worn out, irritable. I mean, he was a teenager still, but, you know, I'd say, how's your day? And he'd be really unhappy. And my younger son was getting really frustrated with him. But the reason that he was so unhappy is because he was so frustrated. And then later when he went to the school for the deaf and came home, we noticed he was in a better mood because he was inspired and learning and had, you know, conversations with friends and would get home and tell us all about it. So he didn't lose from deaf culture. He benefited from it. So, so far we've been talking about some of the emotional and intellectual implications of the mainstream. Now let's talk about the physical implications. You know, I learned something new. We all have these, uh, there are physical symptoms of being mainstreamed. There was a workshop given by Dr. Sam Trechin. He's hard of hearing does not use sign language. In fact, I don't know if he can sign. He spoke and used a sign language interpreter. Very nice guy. And he was talking about the physical symptoms of stress, of having to lip read, which I found interesting. I had never really thought about it. But when you are in the mainstream, the frustrations build. And actually, you end up with physiological symptoms down the road. Here are some of them. One time I was helping a friend move, and it was a big sofa, pretty heavy, and I went to lift it and set it down, and all of a sudden my back went out, excruciating. I couldn't believe it. So I went to the doctor, told him about my back, and the doctor said, that's rough. Uh, You better go for physical therapy. So I went to physical therapy, and the physical therapist did everything they could said, you're, you're okay, but wow, your back and your neck and your muscles are really tight. You know, extremely tight. If you were a rubber band, you would have snapped. You better go to maybe the pool and try to loosen up or take medication or get a hot tub, do something. You really need to loosen up. And I thought, how did that happen? And then I realized that my entire life in the mainstream, trying to figure out what people were saying, caused a lot of tension in my shoulders. And that built up over the years. So I was very stiff. And especially with hearing people. You know, when you go into a deaf group and everyone's signing, all of a sudden I'd relax. I stood at a very normal, in a normal pose. But with hearing people, I was kind of hunched over and tense. And I could really feel the difference in my body. So in the mainstream, in the morning, trying to figure out what everyone's saying, not trying not to look stupid, was very anxiety producing. I had stomach problems, I had headaches. And this is just the short list. There's a much longer list. And I realized that, you know, your body is affected by the mainstream, not just your mind. Something for you to think about. Just food for thought. Another topic that came up from Ian Noon um, from England. He wrote an article, which I really liked. Concentration fatigue. 
So in his article, he describes going to a workshop and reading lips and then getting home and taking off his shoes and putting his feet up on the table and falling asleep. He was exhausted at the end of the day. And I recognize that. When I go to a hearing workshop, even with an interpreter, I feel like I need eye drops. My eyes are so strained by the end of the day. But when I go to the deaf club, I could talk all night. The hours just fly by and I realize, oh my God, it's 1.30 in the morning, it's time to go home. It's a completely different feeling. Mainstreaming is stressful on the eyes and it wears you right out. Now, this doctor, Tretian, talking about these physical symptoms, and then Ian Noon talking about concentration fatigue. Imagine putting those two together. What do you end up with? <laughs> Excuse my French. <laughs> On my son's last year in the mainstream, he would get up at 6.30 in the morning, get all dressed, get ready, and leave by 7.30. I would get up at 6 o'clock and leave at 7. Every morning, we'd meet each other uh, on the way out, have a nice day, and he'd go, yeah, right. Well, one day I got up, got ready, and I noticed that uh, my son wasn't there. He wasn't around, which was really strange. So I went upstairs, opened his bedroom door, and he was still sound asleep, you know, the drool pouring out on the pillow, and I said, what happened? His alarm had malfunctioned. Instead of 6.30 a.m., he actually set it for 6.30 p.m. So I said, hey, look, you gotta get up. He said, what do you think he said? That's what he said. That's a direct quote. Actually, this is what he said. <laughs> wow, the language on that boy? <laughs> Couldn't believe it. Obviously, his language was from his mother. Right? Where did he get those words? But seriously, it really did hit me that that <coughs> scared me. And I look back to my days, it was a real flashback. I remember when I was in the mainstream and every day getting up, the first thing I would say was, I said the same thing. So I really understood where my son was coming from. Two generations of F-bombs every morning. <laughs> and I started thinking about that. Do I want deaf kids to get up in the morning saying this? Do we really want that? No, school's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be interesting. You're supposed to be learning things. You're supposed to love it. You're not supposed to hate it. I work at the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf now, and I'm a school counselor, and a lot of times, and this still happens, every single year, we have uh, these counseling groups and where kids are talking, conversations on all notice, one student starts coughing. And I'll say, hey, are you okay? They'll keep on coughing. And I realize they're actually sick, and I'll say, come on, you need to see the nurse and the nurse will take their temperature, find out they have 102 fever, and I'll say, what's with you? Why did you stay, why didn't you stay home? You're sick. And the student was like, I like it here. You know, the deaf environment, everyone here is deaf, it's so fun. At home, I'm so isolated. There's no one to talk to, not even my family. So communication is everything. Whether you're sick or not, you wanna come to school when you're deaf. I mentioned the book, um, Always in the Mainstream, by Gina Olivia, excuse me, Alone in the Mainstream. And the interaction is so important in school. At Gallaudet University, the freshmen, many of them have grown up in the mainstream, and when they meet other deaf students and they realize they have a shared experience of having been through the mainstream, 
they realize, why couldn't I have met you when I was five or six years old? You know, here we are in our early 20s practically, so late to be meeting. Now my last uh, tale is about the elephant in the room. It's a controversial topic. You know, elephants in the room mean controversial topics. What's controversial? I don't know. Technology? What's a good elephant? Does anyone have an example of a, of a controversial topic? What's an issue that's a little bit sticky? Medical technology. Some of the medical, aha. Thank you, Tim. We have not addressed that yet. Cochlear implants. Let's talk about it. More and more kids are getting implanted. My son in the mainstream felt like he needed to be de with deaf kids, and we called the, the school district and said, my son, you know, he's very isolated. Could we get a bunch of deaf kids together? They could go golfing, go bowling, do something fun. And the district said, no, no, we don't have to do that. Um, th lots of kids have cochlear implants and don't sign, and they speak just fine, and they're doing just fine. And I thought, is that true? Is that possible? So when I wrote Madness in the Mainstream, I thought, maybe this book is going to be obsolete, so I better do a little bit of research. I thought, there must be more to this. Gallaudet, NTID, and other programs with large deaf student populations have a lot of people with cochlear implants. Why are they going there? Why aren't they going to hearing colleges? They go there because they have a sense of belonging. They don't have to work to fit in. They belong in the deaf community, whether they have an implant or not. And also, I'm still, uh, you know, it was odd that the school district said, you know, the kids with the implants are doing fine. If you look at cochlear implant online, here's my main concern, is that parents and teachers make decisions on behalf of the child, including declaring the child is fine. They don't ask the child. And uh, uh, there was a conference on cochlear implants here in the Northeast, and it was focusing on students with cochlear implants, and they invited students to talk about their experience. And sure enough, the students said, school's okay, I can hear okay, but I don't understand everything perfectly. I have to sit in the front of the room. I wish I had captions. That would be ideal. When there's a movie, I would prefer captions. I can't hear enough of the movie. In sports, yes, I get to participate, but sometimes a coach will say something that I don't get, and I have to ask another student. So I'm behind. It's not a perfect solution. And then in Hands and Voices, which is an organization, there's an article um, in about, how, you remember how I was saying how I always fooled people and pretended to understand them? Well, this explains that if you get two cochlear implants, there was a woman who had two cochlear implants, and with one, they figured, well, you're doing fine. And she realized that, no, she really needed a lot of exposure. She needed a lot of sign language and a lot of community interaction to do better. Now, about the um, positive things that parents can do, there are a few things typically that have been missing from what parents do, and I'll share that with you. One mom said about um, her child with a cochlear implant, this, he doesn't need an interpreter, he's fine. But he has no friends. He's completely isolated. And I thought that was really sad. Another situation at Pennsylvania School for the Deaf, we have a wonderful early, early intervention program. And I met a dad whose daughter was four years old, had an implant. And he met another dad who had a four-year-old who did not have an implant. Both of them said the exact same thing, which was the hospital never told them about deaf culture, never told them about the deaf community. They should have, but they didn't.
Now, just to wrap things up, madness in the mainstream. I'd like to talk a little bit about early hearing detection and intervention. You know, a lot of people, people who pre present at these conferences, like the Eddy conference, don't really have a strong background in deafness. I was uh, at a conference back in the 80s, and you know, my favorite, uh, my favorite show at the time was The Cosby Show. Do you remember Bill Cosby? I loved him. At the time, his role was um, as an OBGYN. He helped women have their babies. And believe it or not, that had an influence on me, and I thought about becoming an OBGYN because I liked Bill Cosby so much. And I thought, well, let's say I had become an OBGYN, and my name is Dr. Drawlsbaugh. Would I be standing here using all these big words and talking about pregnancy and birth and explaining that? Would I be talking to you about menopause and all the uh, nuances? I could, but I'm here to tell you I don't know what it means to be a woman. Only women know what it's like to be a woman. And it's the same for deaf people. If you're gonna talk about deafness, have a deaf person talk about it. It's as simple as that. So support HR 440. That suggests a change in LRE, the least restrictive environment, to Establish a balance, and it, by the way, it also applies to blind students. Something worth reading. <coughs> Provide support, and I recommend that you look at this bill and sign the petition online. So I've talked about mainstreaming and all the things that go wrong, but are all mainstreaming programs terrible? Of course not. They need to rest, some, many recognize the needs of deaf students, and when they see a need, they connect with the larger deaf population to provide that support. That's something that needs to continue. Mainstreaming programs should partner with the deaf schools. They have to get that support. A good example is if you go to Rochester, the school for the deaf there in Rochester, Many students are mainstreamed all day, and then they go to Rochester School for the Deaf and study together and interact with other deaf students. And that's a beautiful partnership. I recommend things like that. And last, your support is needed out in the community. Tell people what you know. Talk about those families at, at the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf where they were never told about the deaf community and they ended up hearing it from a friend when their child was already four years old. Those people need your support. Thank you so much for being here tonight. That was great. I want to thank the audience for coming. Mark's presentation was, I learned a lot from it. And his message was very strong, and I hope that you have all learned as much as I have. I'm going to open the floor for those people who want to ask Mark questions or have comments. We're gonna make a line. So just to let you know, if you wanna ask Mark a question or make a comment, just respect the others and their time and don't you know, ask multiple questions so that everybody can have a turn. And same if you have a comment to keep it short. So we'll come on down, you can make a line. And if you want to speak, you, there's a microphone, and if you're going to sign, you can stand and we'll have the voice interpreters for you. So come on down. Do I stand here? Where should I stand? 
You can stand right over here. I'm deaf. You can stand here and look up at the audience. Hello, my name's Joe. I was disappointed about the amount of deaf schools that are closing, especially in New England. I feel like we need to keep deaf schools around for our future. Mark's reply, that's why we need to change that least restrictive environment clause in the law. Near my home in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf has 200. And another school has about 340. But if you look at how many students are mainstreamed, the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf could have 800 students. So really it's that LRE that is the most important thing to support. Okay, thank you. Don't be shy, come on down, make a line. We can have more discussion and ask questions and make comments. I really want to, I wanted to have, a, I have a short comment. Something that I was really interested in was babies and their language acquisition. And deaf and hearing, it doesn't matter. All babies have that already hardwired in their brain to be able to acquire language. And the researcher Petito at McGill University in Canada did some research and found with deaf and hearing babies that the hearing babies, their parents would speak and not sign, but babies would still use hand motions and gestures. And then deaf babies also had that and babbling, but then later the babbling would stop and they would continue with the sign. So it's really remarkable that humans have that already built in. And I've noticed some parents think, you know, we shouldn't sign, we shouldn't, we should stop that process and so they can focus on the babbling becoming speaking. But they're really missing a big part of language development and their baby's communication skills. You know, because hearing babies continue to use their hands and gesture as well. So to really repress that in deaf babies, I'm curious of your opinion. Well, I'm thinking back to my parents who are deaf as well and went to an oral school and they did that if you couldn't even gesture. And so they made a habit of sitting on their hands to really limit that. Even if they weren't using sign language, even gestures were not allowed. And so there's so many different ways of communicating. I don't know why parents would want to restrict any of it. Hi, my name's Tim. And it's not really a question, more of a comment. You were talking about hospitals and doctors don't tell parents about the deaf schools and the deaf community as an option. And I think one obvious reason is because there's not enough deaf authors that really talk about their experiences. And your book is very accurate about experiences in the mainstream, precisely really. And I wish that more authors um, I don't mean to ask you, it's a little off the point, but I'm wondering if you as an author, you know, what you do as an author, what your day looks like in, with reading this book, I mean, writing this book, excuse me. And I don't expect you to, you know, answer right now, but I just wanted to put it out there. If you could maybe help other deaf people to write books by sharing your experience. Well, Madness in the Mainstream took four years to write. I mean, I had my full-time job and my family. Sometimes I'd be very inspired and I would email myself um, some things that I had written so I would have it. And so I would really take advantage of those moments. But it took me four years and it, you know, there's so many people out there with the same story and so we do need to have that shared story. You know, we need more videos and movies and more exposure for people. You know, I know that you could have like index cards with you and write things down as it, they come to you, but as far as being organized or did you just figure it out yourself? Well, I wish I could say I was very organized, but I was not. 
my best writing was when my blood would be boiling and I would feel so inspired and I could really get a lot down on the page. And then other times I'd have to save it for later. And, but then the fire had kind of gone out at that point. And so I really recommend putting some words down when you're feeling it in that moment. Hi, my name's Tori, and I'm a hearing student here, a graduate student at Brown. I was curious, I am not aware, as an ASL interpreter for a mainstream student, the interpreter works with that same student every day. And so are interpreters trained on the content, English, math, and science? Are they trained specifically on that? To do that classroom interpreting? You know, I'm not sure, actually. It's a good question. Any interpreters here that would know the answer? My son had an interpreter. All I know is that she was with him all day. I don't think that she necessarily went to any specific classes to train for it, but that's a good question. I know someone who went to college for science, a deaf student, and that interpreter was not familiar with all the science jargon, and so they had to fingerspell a lot, so that would have been helpful for them. Secondly, I just, I have a comment to let you know that I'm a graduate student for teaching and education and looking at different philosophies and theories for public school. Is that it's supposed to be student focused? And so to focus on the teacher talking the whole time you know, you're not really, it doesn't, that it doesn't support that philosophy. It's supposed to be more student engagement and just have that, the student discussion, the group learning, instead of the teacher just standing up at the front of the room. And so I'm just feeling like if there's an interpreter, you know, that wouldn't support that, that social engagement. Well, I remember when I had an interpreter the first time, I felt like it opened my world because I felt like I had 100% access. But then later, when I was at Gallaudet and I looked back, I realized that it wasn't perfect. There's always gaps. And to back up, you had asked me, and I, I thought of something that I wanted to say about it. An interpreter doesn't necessarily get trained in content, but there often will be a teacher that meets with the interpreter beforehand and goes over what vocabulary might be and they might discuss the content so the interpreter is familiar with it. Thank you. Oh, it's so, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Hi, I'm Sue. I went to a school for the deaf growing up. I had a hearing family. I went to Gallaudet. My parents were supportive of sign language, and then I decided to become a teacher and got my degree, and I worked at a school for the deaf. And there was always negative comments about mainstream, and I was at a deaf school, so I, I didn't you know, know what they were talking about. So I decided to see for myself and get a job in a mainstream setting. And you were right, some students really struggled and they would come to me after their other classes and I would have to reteach them and sit with them and basically teach them the material over again. You know, but like what you were saying, there's students that I thought you, that were successful, but now I'm looking back after your presentation, I'm looking back and thinking maybe they just were faking it. You know, you have parents and teachers, you know, parents of students that think that their child was mainstream for three years and they were successful, and I think, well, they must have been successful because they never came to me for help. But really, they might just have been avoiding me. So really, thank you for bringing that up. I really appreciate it. And one challenge I have as a parent, I have two children, one hearing, one deaf, and the deaf child just graduated from Gallaudet. And when they went, it was 
they were shocked to see deaf students at Gallaudet that couldn't sign. My daughter was shocked. She didn't, she was so angry. Who took their language away? And so in working with parents, some parents feel very guilty, you know, if they communicate through sign language, you know, but then if they get this, the cochlear implant, insurance pays, right? Like 10,000 each, I think, for each year. That's my experience. 60,000? You have the procedure and the therapy after. But yes, insurance covers it. And parents feel guilty almost that they, their child was given this sense of hearing and so they feel like they can't sign because they have to be grateful that insurance covered this procedure. And so how do we change that mindset? Many parents don't want to sign because they say, well, insurance paid and I'm going to ruin it if I sign with my child. Well, really, it's about, you know, do they want to open doors for their child and not limit them to one strategy? Well, I just think that that guilt, that guilt is something that's hard, a challenge for us to deal with. Well, I think we need to ask these parents, do you want your child to have full access? And show them the research that shows that the, the implant, the outcome of implants improves with having sign language exposure beforehand. Hi, everybody. I grew up in a mainstream setting from first grade to junior year, and then I transferred to the Learning Center for two years and experienced that. I was commuting. And that really opened a whole new world there, those two years. And I was really lost. And when you made all those points about about the mainstream experience, I felt like, wow, I can relate to that. And um, we had another deaf student that was a year apart and how they kept us separate, the same, how you discussed that in different classes. And my mother found out and, you know, found out, she was a, worked in the cafeteria and found out there was another deaf girl that was a year apart from me. And I go, oh, I didn't know it. And then later we found each other six months before I transferred. And we realized that we went to the same school and so it really does happen. And this, you know, in 2014, it's still happening. And I really learned from this presentation about the physical implications, not just psychological. And that really hit me and it, it helped me realize why I had all those the headaches and the back pain when I was growing up. So thank you for telling us about those. The madness in the mainstream, it really does happen. We really do just nod and say, I don't know my name. Well, I'll admit, I thought it was better, you know, today. I thought, you know, in the 80s, they didn't have the ADA yet, and interpreters, you know, didn't have to be certified, and now they have all this technology and captioning. So you think technology improves, the mainstream education is going to improve, but it didn't, and so that was really frustrating. You know, in some ways, it's worse. The deaf schools are getting smaller because more students are mainstreaming, so this is really the perfect topic. It's very relevant to what's going on. And I was a VR counselor for many years, and I would see many clients that were students that went through a mainstream education, and we would meet, and one time the parents were there, and we had an interpreter for me, and the student had had a CI. And so we're going through the meeting, and I noticed the student kept looking at the interpreter, and the mother would tap the, the, their child and say, don't look at the interpreter, look at the person that's talking. And so they were forced to do that and couldn't look at the interpreter. And so after the meeting was over, I said, you know, I took the client, I noticed that you were looking at the interpreter and he admitted that he understood the interpreter better than, so, and that's pretty current information. So 
you know, I think it's important that we keep our deaf schools open. We really need to protect uh, our deaf schools. Well, I appreciate what you're saying about the parents saying, th telling, deciding, and the doctors deciding, and really respecting that client and asking them how they felt. That was a great presentation. I was thinking um, our experiences in the same area in Philadelphia, in the Delaware Valley area, in Pennsylvania and growing up at the same time and the different experiences that we must have had, you know, you with the deaf family and me with the hearing family. And another thing that is a challenge for students and adults who have hearing loss is that, you know, before the technology was very limited, you had some captioning, you had the TTY, but now they have some, you could have the CI, digital hearing aids, using a cart reporter, FM system, there's so much available, and still they face challenges. And it's really important for the IEP team or at a town hall meeting, you know, to have those resources, you know, but they might not understand that if it's progressive hearing loss, they might say, well, last year we got you an FM system. We don't want to provide a cart reporter this year. They don't understand that the hearing loss is continuing, and every year, there might be different needs. It doesn't mean that this year what a student needs is going to be the same thing that they need next year. Also, I was wondering, you know, with the internet and more technology, you, cause, you called yourself a mainstream survivor, and I was wondering if you had a website for people that have gone through um, and might label themselves as a mainstream survivor, um, as a resource for people to share their stories you know, where they, don't, they can talk freely. The Gina, Olivia that we were, I was talking about that wrote her, that book, I think she set up a Facebook group. It was called Lunch is the Loneliest Hour. If you look on Facebook, I think she created a group and that's where you can kind of have that open dialogue. But we do need more of that, I think, for people, a place online for people to share their experiences, whether you know they're in high school or middle school. Well, I was shocked to find out there's almost 600 deaf students near my home that aren't at the School for the Deaf, and what is happening to them all? Thank you. Hello again. I'm Tim Riker. Those of you who might want to make comments or ask questions, please feel free to line up. There is no stupid question. Anyone here is free to learn, and we encourage that. I did have another comment and a question as well. Firstly, you were talking about the introjections, meaning um, society, some of the values and beliefs do impact the individual growing up, and that person growing up becomes oppressed because they are trying to emulate those qualities that may not be true to them. And that's really a form of autism, which means oppression, whether it's obvious or subtle, it is oppression. You know, why don't I hear? Why don't I speak? And in fact, that really pertains to the values of the hearing culture, not ours. And this is another question that may open a can of worms, and I don't intend that, but I'm going to go ahead and ask the question. We've had a lively discussion. Should all deaf, hard of hearing, or children with hearing loss, what, regardless of their label, should they be under one capital D, deaf? Should we all be together, regardless of degree of deafness? Yes, we have different experiences, on the one hand, but on the other hand, maybe these divisions aren't useful. Maybe we should be united and work collaboratively. What's your opinion on that? What do you think? First of all, about autism, you know, I realized that I didn't share a story about that. My eighth grade teacher who was so proud of me for talking and 
kind of went overboard when I talked and gave me a big hug. That was very oppressive. That was really autism. Um, but back to your political statement. In my book, I talk about the deaf community. Capital D, deaf. Some people are a little bit intimidated by that. They're not ready for it. And I do need, I feel the need to respect people. I want everyone to feel included. I did go to a summer camp, a baseball camp at Gallaudet, oh, excuse me, at, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And there were deaf people who used ASL. There were deaf people with cochlear implants. And they interacted just fine. It was one community, regardless of the subtle differences in their hearing loss or their communication. I don't know about these separate labels. Maybe they aren't serving us. Maybe we should consider something inclusive. Maybe if we looked at hearing levels, you know, deafness means can't hear, hard of hearing means can hear some. Um, you know, we've already set up some labels that are based on the amount of hearing that one has. And I think that that encourages autism. So I'm wondering, you know, if I say I'm hard of hearing, does that mean I would be rejected by deaf people? and I should stick with hard of hearing people, or I'm closer somehow to the American culture because I'm not completely deaf. And a lot of hard of hearing people would say no, you know, or they might reject the deaf community. But already I feel like these attitudes are being embedded in the different degrees of deafness, and that deaf people or hard of hearing people internalize these attitudes. And yes, there's a strong deaf culture, and that can be internalized. But in our community, we have a wide variety of people with different types of hearing loss, and each group is oppressed in a different way. I'd like to solve this. I'd like to see more equality, more justice, uh, and more value in and amongst the deaf community with all its diversity. We need to write a book about that, you know? That's another book because autism is pervasive and it's very powerful and it tends to separate members of the deaf community from one another. And we have to find a way to overcome it. I don't know how, but we have to find a way. Thank you, Tim. Hi, Tim, my name is Noel, and uh, this has been bothering me, but I do want to clarify one word. It's, uh, the word is, this cart is saying, and I'm, I want to distinguish the word autism, A-U-D-I-S-M. I know it sounds like it should be spelled differently, but it's A-U-D-I-S-M. So for people using cart, we want to make sure that you have that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Martha. I went to the Gallaudet School Counseling Program in the 90s. And I grew up in a profoundly hearing family, and I am profoundly hearing. But my field pertains to school counseling, and I've worked with children for many years. And I feel like their right, their rights are so frequently disregarded. They're oppressed so often. Whether they're hearing or deaf, children as a population in our culture are not full citizens. They're not treated as humans with human rights. Parents tend to pass on, you know, the good with the bad. But when a child is born, if they're different from the parent, if they're deaf and the parent is hearing, how does the parent go out and meet other adults to see a new way of envisioning the future life of their own child? Really the best time is when, you know, when we have deaf staff come in to work with the children, the children are just flabbergasted. They love it. They see someone who's like them and the parent witnessing that is really moved. Um, and they realize, wow, a deaf person can be a professional, drive a car, go to college. And then they realize that their own child can do that too. Sometimes it's the simple exposure to another deaf adult that can change the mind of a hearing parent. 
You know, the technologies are out there, but exposure is huge, and that's something that we need to help parents see. In the day one, in the hospital, as early as possible. I mean, we're identifying babies right away, so we need to change the way we expose parents to other deaf people. Yes. Second comment. Those hearing schools right now are not functioning well. Hearing children suffer. You know, they have diverse backgrounds. There are so many children from homes with terrible chaos going on every day. And then the children get to school for the first time and it's like safe. It's so much more manageable than home. What well, could be an economic thing or it could be a very well-off family, but there's a lot of chaos in the home. And the time when many children can really relax is at school. And the school becomes a fire department. They're putting out fires every day, the school counselors in particular. Instead, what I'd like to see is the school counseling program be more collaborative and understand what diversity looks like and understand the variety of needs out there so they can understand different cultures and understand one another, not only deaf and hard of hearing, but other cultures, hearing kids from other cultures and backgrounds so that we work more cohesively and collaboratively. You know, you made me think of something that might not be right on the point, but you know, Steve and I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania School for the Deaf. I was in the hearing school while he was at the deaf school. Um, it was a big school that he went to, which has now gotten smaller and finally um, collaborated or moved into another school or combined with another school. There is no high school. For many years, there was no high school. So um, in the year 2000 or so, the high school did come back, but for a short time, um, we had these tournaments, in the basketball tournaments in the afternoon. And um, the counselors used to talk about wanting all of the kids from elementary on up to go to those tournaments to see the older deaf kids. And when they did, they were so amazed. And kids from other schools would come, and they were so amazed. It was great exposure. It just blew their minds, the idea that look at all these deaf people and look what they can do. Time is running out, but um, Tim, your point about you know, what would we call this large group with the varied types of deaf people? Uh, it reminds me a little bit of back in the day with the women's movement. Some women still say, I am not a feminist. They don't like that term. And so they don't want to be associated with that group. So um, does that mean you don't believe women have rights? I mean, come on. It's the same for deaf and hard of hearing people. If the group was large and cohesive, they could fight with much more power in numbers that unity could be extremely powerful, whereas the small splinter groups don't really advance the cause. So I don't know what we would call that group, but uh, I think it's a really important idea. I think people might be afraid to use a word, but if people don't want to use the word deaf, we need to look at that and challenge that and find a way to solve it. Thanks, Martha. Um. I was just uh, wondering. Uh, I was just wondering when you have an interpreter in school, um, does the interpreter ever participate in conversations outside the classroom and help you talk with other students, or do you do you? Um, do you bond with your interpreter because that's who you can communicate with? Uh, and do you think that interpreters should try to take on that role of helping the student communicate with other kids who can't hear um, or in the cafeteria? Good question. When my son was mainstream, his interpreter did go with him to baseball practice and followed him around. But that interpreter admitted that it, it's not the same. When you have a group of kids and then you have this one adult, it's not the same as if when kids are alone without an adult. 
there. And so even though the interpreter wasn't there to discipline or anything like that, it just really it changed the dynamics. That's a great question. Thank you for interpreting. <laughs> I think you have to talk in the mic. Oh, yes, excuse me. Um, I wanted to say I love the comment about um, if you want to know about deafness, speak with a deaf person. Um, and I, I actually work as an outreach worker um, with students who are mainstreamed. And I find it's a big race of who sort of gets to them first, either the cochlear implant team or the deaf community. And um, I find in this area it's, it's very difficult because they're only hearing cochlear implant message, cochlear implant message from a renowned medical institution. And do you have suggestions on how to break that down with those individuals? Because it's almost like the conversation doesn't e exist about using sign language or exposing children to deaf culture. Um, and I realize it's probably a much longer question than you can answer right now, but <laughs> I just wanted to put it out there as someone who um, you know, is trying to think about how to break down some of these, these kind of barriers. It's very frustrating. And, I think it's seen a lot of times that the children has not done well in the hearing environment. So it's almost like punishment, or they did bad, badly, so they're sent to the school for the deaf. Um, and I just was wondering what some of your comments were about that. Um, and I did have a second question afterwards, that too. <laughs> well, that's a lot to think about. I remember my first IEP meeting that I told you that there was all those people sitting around the conference table and it was very overwhelming. I had wished there was a deaf person there, a deaf staff or a deaf advocate to balance out. And some organizations do that, go to hospitals. If they do the newborn screening, they'll have a deaf professional. And there, there's a few out there, but it's not enough. Does that, did that answer your first question? question that I had, um, the examples you're providing seem that they were children who had not had cochlear implants. Do you think that the experience of, and I realize it's fairly new, that the experience of children with cochlear implants will follow the same path as other children? And it, do you know if there's been research or studies about that yet? When you say follow the same path, do you mean get the, the same The same issues as this madness in the mainstream? Do you find it's this very similar experiences with those children also? I didn't do too much research related to the CIs, but I was really thinking, does my book apply to students that have cochlear implants? Because you hear so many positive comments. But when I really delved deeper, I found that they do have these needs and this book does apply to them. And it's a complicated topic, very complicated. But the research now does show that, you know, it helps individuals that get a CI to have had that exposure to sign language and that social interaction with deaf children and adults before they have the surgery. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is Joe again. I graduated from Northeastern, but anyway, I majored in engineering. And I'm thinking about when I was in college, you would have the interpreter standing and the teacher might write on the board. And I'm thinking that there should be a different way to set it up, like with captioning, like it is now, you know, in science, when you have the, the pictures and have, do you think we'll have that in the future? So I'm just thinking, because this was in the 80s when I went, and the teacher would write on the board. And so, and they're talking really fast, and the interpreter maybe can't hear, and so I would always feel behind. And I'm wondering if they're going to improve technology like it is here, where like for science, for example, you know, how an atom is made up and how it operates, and it would have the pictures and the concept, and you'd have it all in one place. And so the interpreter would have the information. I'm wondering if they have that now. And it's not fair at colleges that they don't have things captioned. Do you think that they will? I don't think they do yet. They should have that. So I'm going to invent that. Don't copy my idea, Steve. 
Thank you again. I'm thinking of a building. I'm envisioning a building and you know, it's five floors and you see your family doctor on the fifth floor and so you go in the first floor and you get into the elevator and you see a mother come in, you know, has a strong, her strong belief system, like what you're saying about interjection. And so what's your message? How do you, what's your strongest message that you can give to that mother before she arrives to the fifth floor to make that impact that you want to? It's true, you, you have that moment in the elevator. And so what do you say that gives parents the understanding that they need in that quick message? I wanna show them that you can be successful even if you don't speak well and to open your mind. But how you do that in 30 seconds, I don't know. I think you'd have to push the emergency button on the elevator so you would have a few hours before they came to open the elevator. Well, I just think often we meet parents, you know, and have 15 minutes to explain it, and they are still close-minded to it or resisting it, and they have to go through experiences themselves. I do understand that, but I'm just wondering what some concise message that we could deliver that would really impact their thinking. And I don't know the answer to that. Well, with my experience, you know, if someone's born deaf and the doctor gives you all these messages, you create that wall and it's hard to, to do anything about that. You were talking about a movie, No Ordinary Hero. Oh, the super deafy. That movie, the family, the father was resistant for many years and then finally changed. And I don't know if that could happen in 30 seconds. Well, again, I want to thank you for coming to present to us. We're going to close for questions and wrap up for the present with the presentation for the evening. And again, I want to emphasize that I want to thank those who supported this event and Hamilton Relay, also the Rhode Island Com Commission on the Deaf and Hard of Hearing that provided the interpreters. Thank you to the interpreters. Would you like me to introduce you? <laughs> we have Carol Fay and Jess Morgan. They were great interpreters. Also, I want to thank the Center for Language Studies at Brown University providing the food that's outside in the hallway. Please feel free to grab some before leaving. So thanks everybody for coming from Boston, Rhode Island, and those who are connected through the live stream from all over the US and maybe all over the world, we don't know. Oh no, now he's scared. So thank you again.